Hello, my name is Keith, and I'm the pastor of Corden Baptist Church, and this is the second in our series of podcasts uh, addressing various topics uh, that we deal with as biblical counselors. Uh, this is Lori Beard. She's our biblical counselor on staff here at Corden Baptist Church, and today, Lori, we're going to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Every pastor I know deals with it, and I'll say more about that as we go along. Uh, we're talking about depression, right. and depression in our culture is is just everywhere. Um, we all struggle with it. I think of it almost like we think of cancer, mm -hmm. where it's just, it's not a matter of if, it's when you or someone you know is gonna be affected by depression. So kick this thing off for us, Lori, by telling us a little bit about uh, just the way the world defines uh, defines this illness or, mm -hmm. or this malady mm -hmm. called depression. So I took this strain out of the diagnostic code book Depression is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. Mm -hmm. It's also called major depressive disorder or clinical depression. It affects how you feel, think, and behave, and can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. So that was in 2018. Mm -hmm. In that same place, I found out that there, and I, I wrote this down because... I think it could be a source of some of our depression. I found out that there are currently 70,000 ICD codes. So those are mentally right. um, effective codes, things that are wrong with us mentally. Right. As opposed to um, 14,000 codes just a few years ago. Mm. So a few years ago, we had 14,000 mental things that could be wrong. Wow. And now we have 70,000. And mm. then when I started to look into that, and they do these things, you know, you can link, link, link. Over half of those are linked to depression. So things it's like, important. yeah, it's crazy, like anxiety, fear disorder, agoraphobia. I mean, the list is endless, and they link to depression. Mm. They're, they're, they have direct links one to the other. And so I felt it um, kind of odd that so much of what we can't explain yeah. We give a code to, right. and so often those codes link to depression, as opposed to just saying, we're depressed. You're depressed. Right. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was so odd. It is. So I want to hone in now on that definition that you gave us. Um, it was, okay. It's not a bad definition, and that's often the case. Right. Uh, many times secular counseling or, or the world's definition is actually good. It's yeah. okay. Um. I noticed it mentioned mood, feelings, and thinking. Mm -hmm. So the Bible would just call that our heart. Right. Right. When the Bible talks about our heart, it's talking about uh, our will, what we desire, and what we think, right. what we believe. Uh, so tell us a little bit about some of the ways uh, that God talks about depression in the Bible. Well, it's clear. God is very clear that depression is from the beginning. I think about Cain in the very beginning in Genesis. Mm -hmm. Before Cain killed his brother, God said, why, why, why is your face so downcast? Right. And Psalm 42 says, why so downcast, O oh my soul? Mm -hmm. And so downcast, um, brokenhearted, crushed in spirit. And that's all the way through the Bible, especially yes. in the Psalms. Yes. He used to describe David. He's brokenhearted. His spirit is crushed. Anxious. That's in 1 Peter. Um, come to me, all you who are uh, anxious, cast your care on me, heavy right. laden. Yes. Psalm 30 describes it as in the pit. Like yeah. he couldn't get out. He was in a pit. He couldn't get out. And that's exactly how it feels. And I often yeah. hear people who come to me initially who aren't saying I'm depressed, which is almost never a sentence you'll hear from a counseling and <laughs> biblical counseling right. to start with. Right. But when they come to me, they'll use words like I'm just in a pit and I can't get out of it. So mm -hmm. like they'll use mm -hmm. some of the Bible language that God uses to describe it. Um, Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. That is yes. a deep depression. Yes. Um, oppressed, weary. Um, the Bible taught, come to me, all you are heavy laden, and I mm -hmm. will give you rest. Mm -hmm. Depression is often a sense of weariness that really leads to exhaustion. I can't get out of bed. I have no strength. It's, it's, um, you're just weary. Clothed in sackcloth, which was an indication of mourning in the Bible. Right. But the Bible, God uses that as a way to describe your spirit can be clothed in sackcloth. It can be covered mm -hmm. in in mourning. Um, mm -hmm. Withered heart. David says he had a withered heart. Mm -hmm. um, cast down. 
cast down Psalm 42. And he says in there, why so downcast? Why are you cast down? And so God clearly understood that depression was real. Mm -hmm. He filled the Bible up with descriptive words to give us to use. And whether you go to secular counseling or biblical, you'll find yourself using some of these words to describe how you're feeling. Yeah, so often the case, you almost have to borrow from God. Yeah. Because he's the creator. Yeah. And he knows our frame that we're but dust, as the Bible says. And uh, his categories and definitions of who we really are and what's really going on are always true and always best. And it's amazing how people who don't even know the Bible or haven't even read yes. it, they use the same words to describe what's happening yeah. that God uses. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the effects. You, you, you mentioned some of them, but go into a little more detail about yeah. the effects of depression. I think it's important to talk about how depression affects us because we're made up of a body and a soul. Mm-hmm. And so biblically to understand that is important as um, counselees and counselors right. so that you can be watching and listening. Sometimes what a person looks like physically, what a person says emotionally, how they project their emotions mm-hmm. will really give you good insight into what's happening in the heart. So mm-hmm. physically, depression has a look. It um, Often people who are depressed want to be wallflowers if that term means anything to you, they just want to be in the background. I want to fade away and not be seen or heard. And to do that, they'll affect their clothing. They certainly don't want to draw attention. And so baggy clothes, um, anything that doesn't fit well, that won't look good, they're not necessarily concerned about makeup or hair. It's not to say, I have seen people go to the extreme and do the um, over-dressing thing, but it's much more rare than the baggy clothes no makeup. They don't want any attention. Um, there's often a pale collar that goes with depression, and that's often a result of staying in out of light. Mm-hmm. So um, people who are depressed mm-hmm. actually have a physical difference to their um, collar because they are not exposed to light. They're in more often than they're out. Um, their expressions are listless. If you'll look at someone who um, who comes in and finally owns that depression and just says, I just can't get out of bed. I'm, I'm so depressed you'll notice that their eyes are often listless. There's no Mm -hmm. life in them. Mm -hmm. And so like really paying attention to that, either as a sister in Christ or a brother or a counselor is a big deal. Um, They won't look up at people. They, and I'm not a big in the eye kind of person either. I can do it for a while. And then I'm like, I try not to look at the camera (laughs) because it's not really my thing, but this is extreme. They, they, because depression speaks to you that you don't have worth, that you don't have dignity. And so they don't look people in the eye because who wants to see me? Um, Eye contact is super painful. And then, um, it, it sounds like mumbling incoherent sentences Depression is a lot like anxiety and fear. It kind of controls the mind Mm -hmm. and it speaks to us. It tells us things. It it says, um, no one wants to hear you. You're not worth listening to. It's ridiculous the lies that we hear when we're battling in our mind with depression, but we believe them. And so uh, we mumble more than we speak clearly in case you don't want to hear me. I'm not taking your time or attention. Or in case I don't have anything intelligent to say, in which I'm not depressed right now, and often I still don't have intelligent things to say. (laughs) Thoughts don't run together. There's a lot of confusion. Um, Their sentences don't always go together. So they might be talking about their dog died and then switch completely over. You might even see them go from mood to mood doing that Mm -hmm. in a sentence. Mm -hmm. Emotionally, the mindset for depression is what we think and how we think about it is that depressed people cry all day. Like they just yeah. they just mindlessly cry. They don't even know why. And then we end it there. Mm-hmm. And it is true that depression can cause an emotional reaction that causes us to cry because we're just sad. Right. Often we don't know why we're sad. It is perfectly okay to answer to somebody, I don't know why I'm crying. I'm just crying. Mm-hmm. That's okay. Mm-hmm. But some don't cry. Some don't cry. Um, don't shed tears. Some rage. Depression is a control thing. It causes you to be out of control. I have no control of my emotions. My emotions are controlling me. We can't define it that way, but we know it's happening. And so that causes anger and it causes fear. Some people scream. Some people throw fits Mm -hmm. um, because they... 
they desperately need to know what's going on and they need to be in charge of it right. and pushing in a little bit trying to get somebody to get up out of bed let's get up today let's try this let's um, leave the house go to the store it's, some of the ways that they refuse that is however they can get you to listen to them that might look like a fit yeah. some try to hide their insecurity and sadness with abundant joy they put on a mask so mm -hmm. they go all week long barely able to get out of bed but it comes sunday mm -hmm. christians are notorious for this yeah. if i'm gonna go to church i need to slip my mask on and often we'll do it in the car on the way to church and like your husband's looking at you like okay you haven't spoken you haven't cooked a where's this way woman been? who are you can i take you home with me after church and so it's just it's and that's kind of what we're trained to do because as christians and we'll talk about this in a minute but as christians depression is almost a dirty word yeah. it's it's worse than fear it's worse than anger and so we we often mask that so if i see women who are abundantly joyful all the time and I know we live in a fallen world mm -hmm. I just start to pray for them because I'm like that's just it's simply not possible yeah. all the time yeah that's right it's really helpful Lori to to hear you uh, address it from the Christian perspective um, we often are good at hiding as mm -hmm. Christians and so it's not as obvious sometimes until you really start to talk and press in with somebody it's also very helpful to know how often in the Bible uh, God shows us people, mm -hmm. his people, getting depressed, and then he tells us why they were depressed. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about the, the causes uh, as you read the storyline of Scripture and you see this happening to people, right. what God says caused it in all these folks. Right. Well, and spiritually, depression often looks like um, a sense of dejection, loneliness. Mm -hmm. People struggle to make and keep friends. Um I, I guess one of the people I would go to first in the Bible because he he refers to himself this way over and over and over is David. Um, yes. And David, the and, king, the king, yeah. David. And right. really, when you think about right. David, the the Bible is so clear that David is a man after God's own heart. That's mm. the that's straight from the Bible, and also that he's the the first king that really led well, and that he's the king that Jesus was promised from right. and knew that and knew that God kept his promises. So he has all reasons to be joyful. He has all reasons to have hope. Right. And yet he fills the songs up with stories of despair and mm. dejection. And he is, he's rejected by his son, Absalom. He knows a great right. amount of sorrow over that. He loses children. So, but if you look at Psalm 38, this is a classic case in Psalm 38. David's weighed down by a burden of guilt. He's overwhelmed by guilt. And so he knows God. He knows who God is. The Bible's clear that he loves God, but he sinned against God. Yeah. And so um, you won't hear this at a secular counseling session. Right. Because actually, that's why we have 70,000 um, diagnostic codes because mm -hmm. nothing's ever just sin or just mm -hmm. my fault mm -hmm. but David says it is David right. says this sin has weighed me down my soul is heavy he was right. bitter right. and so um, mm -hmm. guilt caused sin and sin caused a depression to settle over David's soul yeah. and he and that's not the only time David refers to that and when he talks about it, he says my bones are wasting away my yeah, heart yeah. is withered um, Elijah, 1 Kings 19. <laughs> you, yeah. and you have to know the background here. Elijah has just done miraculous yeah. things. He's seen the miracles of God. Yeah. So again, this is not a man who has suffered this enormous dry sp spell mm -hmm. with God. This is a man that's seen the greatness of God in the land of the living. Yeah. And he says, take my life. It's right. better if I was never born. Right. I, I want to be dead. I'm no better than my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And and that was caused simply by discouragement, exhaustion, and fear. Yeah. He, he just was, he was exhausted. Yeah. He was discouraged. Not only had he seen the greatness of God, but they had seen the greatness of God. And why don't they care? Mm -hmm. Why aren't great things happening? Mm -hmm. Man, if that's not a message for us today, as right. um, I see that it's got to happen with pastors. It happens with me, other biblical counselors that I converse with. Um, it happens with mamas. I'm pouring myself in. I'm investing in my children, and I don't see change, and they're still fighting and hitting. And 
Elijah's a really good one, if I could just yeah, break sure. in. Just because he he just came off this spiritual high. And I think it's humbling for us to realize as frail, broken, even redeemed humans, we can't sustain that spiritual high. No. We're not capable. And so it's so often it's just it just takes one threat from Jezebel. Yeah. And he's running like yeah. a scared boy. He's scared so, to death. Yeah. But I think it's a big deal to realize we weren't meant to sustain a spiritual high. Yeah, not yet. Yeah, and because <laughs> right. ultimately the the spiritual high that we need is to be reunited with Christ. Amen. And here, as long as we live in a fallen world, yeah. we should expect to plummet yes. and to do that because valleys mm -hmm. are necessary for growth. It's and good. I think that's a big deal for yeah. Um, people who struggle to know it's okay. It's actually mm -hmm. quite biblical. Mm -hmm. um, Jonah is one of my favorites. Oh. Jonah is clearly depressed. He says in Jonah 4, take my life. Mm -hmm. I'm better off dead, which is quite ironic because he's in, in, in the fish's belly. He doesn't think he's better off dead. Mm -hmm. You know, he's willing then to do whatever God tells him to do. Mm -hmm. I would be too, to mm -hmm. get out of that belly. And that was caused by anger and frustration. It was not caused by... Um, what was happening in the world at that time, it was not caused by discouragement. Jonah was mad. He didn't get his way. Right. And he allowed that anger to sit in his heart like a stone, and eventually that will depress your soul. Mm -hmm. it, there's just no way around it. When you try to outrun God and get things to be your way, it will depress your soul, yes. especially if you belong to God, because he won't let go. So it's like a tug of war. Yeah. And that's depressing. Um, Job, I, I think Job probably is the saddest one for me. Mm -hmm. Job 3, why didn't I die at birth? I have no peace. This is a common complaint when people come to my office. And often, I will tell you this, that normally by the time someone comes to my office saying this, I have no peace, they have already sought out several secular therapists and spent a lot of money on treatment. Mm -hmm. They say, I have no peace, no quietness. I loathe my life. My soul is bitter. No peace, no quietness, chaos, bitterness, terror. Um, he was in pain. His body was in pain. Right. And, and what brought this on was no fault of Job's. Job had suffered a devastating loss, and he was... His body was bound by a physical illness. And um, one of the things that I see when I read Job, and we see it in the friends who appeared to love him. They, they yes. were just kind of right. junky counselors, which yeah. I am sometimes too. But, right. but they needed there to be a reason Job was depressed. Right. And it needed to be something he had done because then it could be fixed. Right. And um, one of the things I realized several years ago about grief is that it can't be fixed that God deals with the grief of his people according to his season in everything, to everything there's a season. Yeah, so it's like it's a big deal when you're um, a sister in Christ or a brother and you're helping someone grieve just to remember that you're not, God didn't equip you to fix their grief. Mm -hmm. He just mm -hmm. equipped you to walk along beside them in their grief. Amen. And let that, if if um, if you see them struggling with sadness, let that be a normal struggle and make sure they know it, yeah. that it's okay. This That's is good. okay. Yeah. Overwhelming loss, people who lose um, children, people who lose houses to a fire, um, the, when we go, when the Baptist church goes, one of the things they're training, and I'm taking a couple of those trainings, I've never got to go, but I'm trusting I will, where you go to um, mass disaster sites, is don't tell them everything's going to be okay. Tell them that God loves them. Right. Because when right. you tell them everything's going to be okay, then you surely intend to fix some things, mm -hmm. and you can't fix anything. Right. So like making sure that that sadness that they feel is okay. Yes. And that's really what Job needed to hear. Like, you have suffered loss. That should. It's normal mm -hmm. for your soul to be depressed. And and yet, you'll hope and praise in God, mm -hmm. not try mm -hmm. to take it from him. And then um, Moses. I, I think Moses is um, probably more familiar to me as far as watching pastors because he says, yeah. Moses says, blot me out of the book you have written. I mean, that's a pretty big deal because Moses knew he right. knew who God was. He knew what what that meant to say, blot me out of that book you've written. Mm -hmm. And and actually his depression, his sadness was caused by the grief that he felt over the sin of his people. Yes. And so like when you're in a position of leadership, so dads, um, mamas, 
so susceptible to this. Grandparents who are helping to raise their grandkids, right? Uh, pastors, counselors, deacons, you're susceptible to this because you are loving and investing in people that still have freedom to make choices. Yes. And so, like, often they're not going to just come along mm -hmm. and say, I'm going to do exactly because everybody mm -hmm. has exactly what you say if it's the right thing. They, they don't even do that for God. Often right. I don't do that. I don't obey God like that right. with unflinchingly. And so that, that leaves leaders, mamas, daddies, all those people are leaders in some way. It leaves them in a position to feel great sadness because you know there's a consequence. You know, I was never one of those moms that cried when I spanked my kids. I didn't really have like, oh my gosh, I've got to spank you. It's going to break my heart. It did their dad, but not me. <laughs> but it did break my heart to see them willingly walk into disobedience, knowing right. there's a consequence for that. And it's going to be extremely painful for you. Yeah. And so like it was, and you, we live in a world where we assume that a lot. Mm -hmm. That happens a lot. It is natural that it should cause some sadness. I'm mean, going think about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was just a young boy when he was called. The weeping prophet. And, and Jeremiah was the weeping, and he wept his whole ministry. Yes. And, um, you know, <laughs> Jeremiah was not well-liked. He was rejected. Yeah. He was dejected. Yeah. He was lonely. Mm -hmm. And that's uncomfortable for us to talk about prophets that way. It's uncomfortable for us to say in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was lonely. Yes. Wake yes. up. Wake up. Yeah. He didn't need those three disciples to pray for him right. or with him. Mm -hmm. He was in perfect fellowship with God, mm -hmm. but he was fully human. Yes. And what a lonely thing to be facing what he was facing alone. And right. Jeremiah sees this. Jeremiah is facing uh, the end of Jerusalem. He yeah. sees what's coming for them. He's brokenhearted, and he's basically facing it alone. Mm -hmm. So he was a weeping prophet. How do you come alongside a weeping pastor or a weeping mama? You come alongside them and acknowledge that, that this is a sad time for you. Mm -hmm. This is a sad time for you, but I am listening. Yes. I'm praying and I'm listening. And sometimes that's the only text I see in is I'm praying for you mm -hmm. and I've got time to listen. I don't have great wisdom. Mm -hmm. I, this is a time God's called you to. It's a hard time. It's a work he's called you to, but you're not alone. Yeah, amen. That's so helpful, sister. And I've seen you do that. I've experienced you doing that for me. It's been a huge blessing. My family, uh, so many families that know you, um, and there's great hope. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned mm -hmm. Jesus yeah. in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. There's great hope uh, in knowing that our Savior was a man of sorrows, yes. acquainted with grief, and that uh, he was lonely, that he did want his friends' yes. companionship in his moment of, of great need uh, as, as the Son of Man, uh, facing the wrath of God, yes. quite frankly, yes. uh, on our behalf. Sweat great drops of blood, um, and so there's there's great hope for those of us who who also have the burden of the Lord and a love for God's people, uh, just to look to Christ yes. and, and to know that there's hope there. Uh, I want you just as we wrap things up to to tell me a little bit about again just how normal is this for Christians? Okay, I think this is a really big deal for Christians. I think yeah. it's hopeful but I don't think we talk about it enough, is that depression is actually fairly normal in the world we live in. We live in a fallen world. Yes. We were created for Beautiful. perfection. Yes. God created man and woman. Mm -hmm. That was the epitome of creation. It said, it is good, very good. And then boom, sin entered the world. And so when sin entered the world, it disturbed, it, it disrupted, it severed our fellowship with God that had been so easy. It is no different if you have ever been a, um, one of the things that I counsel the most in women are women who have had several relationships with their moms. And some of these women are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and that is still destroying their soul. Right. And it's affecting every single decision they make. And that's, that's what happens. And then they're confused. Like, why can't I get over this? Because it wasn't meant to be that way. And so right. depression is right. the same. We, we live in a fallen world. It's not meant to be this way. And the hope for Christians is it's okay to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, it's okay to not be embarrassed or ashamed. There's no reason to be ashamed. Yep. 
And one of the things that is a big deal when talking about this is how we approach the way we speak to people who have the courage to admit they're depressed. Like inferring that, um, for instance, I heard several years ago, um, a young lady in a class talked about, I'm just, I just am so depressed. I have a hard time getting out of bed. And the immediate first response was, you're a Christian. There's no way you have, you have no right to be depressed. You know, mm -hmm. the giver of joy. And yeah. that, that lady was done. I, when I went to her privately, I couldn't get her to talk. I, she was like, she's right. I'm guilty of not trusting the Lord. And so, and often we do get to the bottom of some, is this a trust issue? Is there some, do we need to work through that? Mm -hmm. But but the truth is, because we love the Lord and we're created for fellowship for Him, we are going to battle depression at different points in our life. Yes. And having the courage to talk about it, there are means that God gives in the Bible for battling this depressed spirit. You see, David mm -hmm. used them a lot, but we don't get to those because we won't talk about it. Yeah, that's really good. I think we um, it goes back to our almost the way we've been trained as Christians yeah. to cover it up. We buy into, whether we would admit it or not, a subtle form of the prosperity gospel. Oh, yes. It says I should just be happy, go lucky all yes. the time following Christ. And yeah. that's not even the expectation of the New Testament for followers no. of Christ at all. Um, the expectation is we learn how to rejoice even in the pain. Yeah, and that's the suffering. right. Yeah. Depression really is a vicious cycle. It is. Um, it, it's kind of a downward spiral. And it's a weird thing. Uh, as uh, I don't know any pastor that doesn't struggle on some level with depression. That's why at the beginning mm -hmm. of this, I said it's near and dear mm -hmm. to me. Uh, I've struggled with it. C.H. Spurgeon struggled with it. It gives me great hope. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> the greatest preacher that's ever lived other than Jesus struggled yes. with it. I uh, wrote a book about it. It's very helpful. Um, and he did what you said. He was willing to publicly mm -hmm. actually write a book and talk about it. He did. Um, which gives gives us all kind of a model yeah. that we've got to start talking about it. Um, what are some of the, the ways that God has given us um, when this very normal thing right. starts to creep into our life? What, what, are the, what are the battle plans, if you will, that God's given to his people? Well, I think um, the first and um, most obvious one is um, a written prayer journal or a yeah. written... Um, scripture journal and mm. you can buy one there everywhere or uh, make sure it's biblical <laughs> always use revive our hearts or a john mm. piper they make those mm. but um or you can make your own because yeah. the bible is available to us all and so mm. actually opening your bible to the book of psalms and yeah. picking out some of those psalms and i'll you know we can add those to our um mm. podcast later but picking out some and then actually praying those Right. So like when I am battling a just a deep despair in my soul, I, I did this week, just battled. I just went straight to the Psalms. I'm like, I'm not even messing around mm -hmm. with this. Mm -hmm. And I that's what I, like, Lord, I am in a pit and I can't get out of the pit. My soul is in despair. I literally just right. borrowed David's words. Yes. And, and David always resolves with, yet my soul will trust you and praise you. And so right. it's just such a sweetness. So just journaling a prayer journal. And you can do that at home. Um, find somebody who's done that well and just talk to them. Find a sister in Christ mm -hmm. who you know journals and they'll walk you through it. It's mm -hmm. um, church community. I just said find somebody. Um, you got to be super careful who you choose to share your depression with. Right. We live in a world that's afraid to come to church and say to a sister, man, I am battling depression in my soul because we're mm -hmm. afraid of what the connotation of that is. Right. But we'll get on it. I was on a subway in New York City several years ago, and I'm a, I'm a talker. I, I, I don't know a stranger. And so I was on a subway, and on that subway ride, it was about an hour and a half, and on that subway ride, at least 13 people, I just moved from seat to seat and told people who I was and talked to them, but at least 13 of those people talked to me about deep depression in mm. their lives. It was mm. in New York City. Wow. You know, New York City people are supposedly rude and don't talk to you, but <laughs> these guys were pretty open. And I was so impressed with how e easy it is to say that to a stranger. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible says right. for Christians to use your community God has given you. Yes. So often we pick a stranger because we don't know them and we're not afraid of their opinion. 
Mm-hmm. We don't fear mm-hmm. what man will think of us when they're a stranger. Right. But inside our church, we're fearful. Well, yeah. what will they think? Will they? Right. I have a. They'll think I have a good marriage. I have healthy kids. What do I have? Instead of just saying this is the means God said to use. Yeah. So go find a brother. Go find a sister and say I'm battling some. Um, depression in my soul, and can you just pray with me? Yeah. It is really it starts that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The next one's kind of a weird idea for people who are depressed. And when I vol- volunteer it up, and actually uh, often I don't volunteer it. I say we're doing this together, mm-hmm. but often people look at me like you have lost your ever loving mind, and it's ministry. Yes. And so um, one of the things that happens, you said earlier, and I thought it was so smart. Depression is a cycle. It is, it does this. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't ever do like boom and then done. Yeah. Once you get into those patterns and it, things get really dark, it, you don't just walk out of the dark. Light has to be shed into the dark yes. and then the dark has to flee. Yeah. One of the things that does that is ministry That's and right. servanthood. Mm-hmm. And we don't live in a world where servanthood is, it's just not thought of. Yeah. But when I am at my lowest... When my heart is sinking fast, one of the things that I automatically do, and you'll see this if you read Spurgeon's work, you'll see it, mm-hmm. is I find who has a need. I don't care if it's clean. You know, new mm-hmm. mama needs a clean house, needs a load mm-hmm. of laundry done. Always somebody needs a meal. There's always someone who's getting cancer treatment. There's always someone who's worn out and exhausted. There's always a pastor who's always glad for whatever you'll do. Church always needs to be cleaned, and mm-hmm. I just go do it. I don't mm-hmm. talk about mm-hmm. it. I don't um, because because I it's a way for me to get out of that circle that yeah. I've built around myself. Yeah. Because depression it turns inward. Yes. And so like when you begin, you have a heart for people and you can see the needs, but you will right. find the longer you stay in that dark, mm-hmm. the less you can see the world around you. Right. And though it's dying and in need of Christ, you can no longer see that. And so right. like getting out and being a servant is gigantic. Yeah. It 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 gives you an outward view and not mm-hmm. an inward view. Yeah, that's really good. Really get your, big. Get your eyes off yourself. Yeah. Think about someone other than yourself. Right. Yeah. And the last one is about where your eyes are. And yeah. um, if you look in, in the Psalms, if you read the Psalms and you're faithful to do that, you will see that David worships his way out of yes. the pit. Yes. He doesn't. Um, right. He doesn't pull himself up by the bootstraps. I always. I hear that. I used to say that all the time, and now I'm right. just like, God forgive me. My grandma said it, so I said it. He doesn't pull himself up by the bootstraps. Most of the time, when he starts the psalm, he is literally physically and emotionally debilitated. He's not able to pull himself up by the bootstraps. Yeah, and the right. way he always gets out of the pit is he sets his eyes on Jesus mm-hmm. and he just begins to worship. And what happens when you do that? You remember that your depression is great, but your rescuer is greater. Amen. Your rescuer is greater. And Amen. so That's your right. hope is in Christ and now you've remembered Christ. Yes. Amen. Let me read a, a passage of Scripture to end our time today. Um, the Apostle Paul is a, a good model. We've not mentioned mm-hmm. him yet, but boy, did he know something about depression. Yeah. And he, like David, worships his way out of the pit, turns his eyes upon Christ. And I like to, what I've learned in dealing with my own depression is I must learn to preach the gospel to myself. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to be a preacher to learn to preach the gospel to yourself. You just need to be a Christian who's Mm -hmm. saved by grace through faith in Christ. So you know the gospel, preach it to yourself. And you hear him doing this uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Mm -hmm. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. And that's preaching the gospel of Christ to yourself. 
and Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ yes. is always the best solution yes. to get out of the pit. It is. Thanks for your time today, Lori. Thank you.